Hello, let's get uh, uh, started. Uh, first of all, sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, so uh, today we were first keep talking about Rob. Uh, then we will talk a little bit about how to defeat Rob and also start talking about uh, how heat works. And uh, it seems like my internet is not very good. So uh, I will try to do the demos, but it uh, seems like there are some issues. Anyway. Uh, so last week we learned how Rob works and uh, you had a challenge there. Uh, this week I give you guys another challenge, which is Rob 2. Uh, you only need to do 32-bit version of this. Uh, previously, uh, you did a 64-bit version of uh, Rob 1 and Rob 2, you only need to do the 32-bit version. And, uh, and I give you the source code of Rob 2. Uh, you can see this is a source code. We have a... Uh, main function which calls uh, valve foo. Uh, valve has one uh, argument and uh, a local buffer. Uh, it opens a temp file in the temp folder. Uh, if that doesn't exist, it's just exit. Uh, otherwise, it will read uh, 190 bytes from the file to the buffer. So there is no buffer overflow there. Uh, then it will simply move the first four bytes to uh, the return address. So you give 190 bytes and the first first four bytes, we will just move it to, to return address. So, which means you can only overwrite the return address, right? You don't really um, overwrite uh, other things. Uh, after that, uh, this part of the code will move the second four bytes to uh, e, e, re, register EAX. Uh, that's it. So it actually only take um, eight bytes here, right? Four bytes to the return address, uh, another four bytes to the uh, register EAX. Uh, by the way, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. So uh, you need to use ROP uh, to get the flag of this. And uh, you need to figure out how to do this by yourself. But I will give you some uh, clues here. The, the clue here is you cannot overflow the entire stack, um, but uh, you can use a gadget to exchange the value in EAX and uh, ESP. So basically you want to change the stack to point to a lot of place instead of the original stack. Um, the exploits were at the beginning, they were looking at something like this. You are looking for the gadget, exchange, EAX, ESP, then return. That's the first gadget you are going to look for. And that gadget's address will be overwritten to uh, the return address. Uh, then the second um, four bytes uh, will be wherever your real um, control data is, your real exploit is. And you want you can put that in the buffer itself. You can put it in <coughs> in uh, environment variable. Uh, but that value will be exchanged. And that value will be put in, into EAX, then uh, with the first gadget, that will be exchanged to ESP, right? So then after that, you just have our original um, raw gadgets to get, um, to capture the flag. So that's the basic idea of this challenge. And um, um, I'll give you guys one week to finish this challenge. Um, this will be part of the homework. Okay, so um, after Rob, there were actually several other ideas to even generalize Rob to other indirect control flow transfers like um, uh, COP, call-oriented programming and uh, uh, jump-oriented programming. Uh, they are kind of related. They were kind of like in the same paper. So this is a paper published in uh, Asia CCS 2011. 
uh, and this paper introduce, introduced a jump oriented programming. So instead of looking for gadgets that end with a return instruction, we look for gadgets that end with a jump instruction or a core instruction. So that's the idea. Uh, however, uh, those gadgets are harder to uh, chain together. <laughs> you have to use a different technique to chain them together. Uh, and uh, uh, it's harder to pull them off, basically. So we're not going to do that in this class. The, in general, how do we defeat uh, this kind of uh, attacks, uh, Ralph, Cop, or uh, Job? Um, so like we did in previous uh, attacks, uh, uh, we, we list the conditions that uh, the attackers uh, need to pull off the attack. Then we think about, uh, can we take off this condition, right? So sometimes that doesn't really, uh, really stop the attacker, but can make the bar for attacking a little bit higher, can slow down the attacker, right? So the attacker first needs to subvert the control flow to the very first gadget. Uh, in our example, <coughs> the attacker still need to overflow the return address. That's uh, the very first time sub the attacker subvert the control flow. Uh, also, the attacker needs to control the content on the stack. Uh, they don't really need to inject code there, or they don't need to inject the code anywhere. But still, they need to um, control the stack. Uh, the Rob2 example I just gave you guys, the, your homework, uh, you don't control the original stack, but you still need to control um, a, a lot of stacks somewhere else. Also, you need to have enough gadgets in the address space that you can chain them together. You also need to know the address of those gadgets. Uh, and uh, you should have the ability to, uh, usually you need the ability to start execution anywhere, right? Like in the middle of the instruction, so you can have new gadgets. If every instruction uh, aligned four bytes or eight bytes, and the execution can only start at places aligned with four bytes or eight bytes, then you are always executing legal instructions. Then you, you will not have enough gadgets. So then let's say uh, some of the papers were published in previous years and uh, what kind of ideas uh, they were uh, thinking to stop Rob and some of them actually can stop even uh, something, something even more, uh, other attempts. Uh, the first paper I want to talk about is this control flow integrity paper. Uh, the title is very short, just control flow integrity. Uh, when the title is short like this, uh, you get a feeling how uh, important uh, this paper is. So this paper was published in 2005 and it got a test of time award in 2015. Uh, actually right now I'm, I am in uh, CCS uh, 2023 uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, that's why uh, the delay of the class, sorry about that. So as you can see that, uh, in this paper, uh, the authors proposed a property called control flow integrity, which means the control flow should not be modified, should not be tampered from some predefined uh, control flow graph. Okay, So we will never allow any control flow to places that we should never go. Right? That's a basic idea. That's a basic security property. However, it's not easy to achieve this property. So in this paper, uh, they talk about two different things. Uh, one is uh, the forward property. Forward edge property means the indirect calls, the indirect jumps. Um, the target of those should be a valid target in the pre-computed control flow graph. Another one is uh, the return address, uh, which actually this paper proposed the shadow stack. So we already talked about shadow stack in the first half of the class, but we didn't talk about this paper. Shadow stack was from this paper. Shadow stack protects the return address. Uh, it doesn't protect the uh, forward edge. It, return address is like 
the backward edge. So the property of CFI basically restricts the control flow of a program to valid execution choices. Uh, CFI enforces this property by monitoring the program at runtime and comparing its state to a set of pre-computed valid states. If an invalid state is detected, an uh, alert is, uh, is raised, uh, usually just to terminate the program. So any CFI mechanisms consists of two uh, components. Uh, one is uh, uh, offline analysis component, uh, static or dynamic, to recover the control flow graph of a, of a program. Um, but of course, uh, at different levels of precision, some approaches will be super accurate, some approach will not. Uh, then you will have the dynamic runtime enforcement mechanism, mechanism that restricts control flow uh, according to the generated uh, control flow graph. Uh, later, we are going to say some uh, concrete examples of uh, how it works. Uh, before that, let me <coughs> emphasize one, one more time, what is indirect call, indirect jump, and what is direct call and direct jump. So in a program, we, we call um, direct jump or di direct calls, uh, those are basically instructions, uh, call and jump instructions with a hard-coded address as the argument. So it's a fixed address. So after the compiler or linker done their job, uh, this address will be included in the opcode. So it's part of the code. And the code part, you can make it read-only or executable-only. So it's not writable. So attackers will not be able to change that part of the code. So the direct call and direct jump cannot be subverted as well because it's hard coded. However, there are also indirect call or indirect jumps. Um, basically, those are instructions. They use a register as an argument, like a call, uh, EAX, call, uh, RAX. A jump, EAX, jump, RAX. Obviously, when you look at the instruction here, you don't really know what the value uh, RAX or EAX will have at runtime because it's just a register. The register's value will only be determined at runtime, right? Also, the function return is the same. <clears throat> that is also uh, one kind of indirect um, jump uh, because Return instruction retrieves its target from the stack. So it's not hard coded because the stack is writable. It can be changed. So the indirect call indirect jump, they are forward edges. And the return function returns, they are uh, backward uh, edges. Also, there could be interrupts and the interrupts uh, returns. Um, but uh, uh, in this case, we were not spend too much time on that. So let's to make a, take a look at this very concrete uh, example. Um, in this example, uh, we are going to say the idea of uh, CFI uh, forward edge enforcement uh, idea. Uh, the backward edge enforcement is shadow stack. You already uh, saw that in the first half of the class. So left-hand side, we have a very small piece of program. We have a function called the foo. Uh, foo uh, takes one parameter, uh, user. Then uh, it has a local variable, which is a function pointer. We call it func. It, po it can point to uh, different functions. Uh, then, <coughs> depending on the input of user, uh, the function pointer can point to two functions, either the function bar or function bus. Those functions have the same prototype, just the void uh, and it doesn't take any parameters. So this function pointer can point to uh, either of them. Then we just make the function call func, right? So, the idea of CFI is 
when we make the function call func here, here, the machine code here eventually will be an indirect call function, like call EAX or EBX. We don't know which register the compiler will choose, but it will be something like that. So the idea here is <laughs> uh, before we call this function, we were the compiler will instrument some instructions before this function. And that instrumentation will check the runtime target of that register, let's say EAX, and make sure that EAX can only have a valid address. It cannot be any arbitrary address in the address space. So what do we mean by valid address here? Then there are um, many different levels of precisions. Uh, for example, um, well, if the if you require higher precision, it's actually harder to achieve. It requires complicated uh, control uh, program analysis techniques. <clears throat> so let's say the first level of uh, precision, very coarse grain, is the target can be any function address, right? So it can be uh, the address of bar, bus, or booth, or bus. But you can see that even best, it doesn't have the same prototype, right? It's it's not supposed to be a good one, uh, but that's what kind of policy CFI can enforce. Another one is the target address uh, could be the uh, any address with the same function prototype. For example, bar, buzz, or booth, they all have the same prototype then we may allow that. So this is better than the previous policy, but still not perfect. Then the third policy, or even better, is you do, the compiler does very complicated program analysis. Then find out that func can only be either bar or bus. Then before the function call, the check where we'll make sure that uh, either bar or bars is going to be called. Otherwise, uh, it were <coughs> the system or the, the program will simply crash. So that is the forward uh, setup. Yeah. So obviously, before the function returns, we can check the backward CFI, and that is the shadow stack part, which we already talked about. So here, we can instrument the shadow stack part. Here is a even more concrete example for the forward edge. <laughs> this is in the original 2005 CCS paper. Okay, let's say there is an indirect jump. In this case, not an indirect call, but an indirect jump. There is a jump E C X instruction. Then this is an original code. The so after CFI. <laughs> This piece of code will be changed. Uh, we will have uh, some instrumentation here. So here we have three instruction instrumentations. Uh, uh, this is called label-based uh, CFI. It's not very fine grained but uh, it, it can protect some kind of text. Okay. So first, the target we have is ECX. Then we compare whatever is at that address ECX, whether that address is a value. Is a, you can see it's a hard-coded value there. So basically, previously our target is at ECX. Now our target is not really at ECX anymore. It's at ECX plus four. At ECX, we have a label. The label is kind of like a random number. We will check if the target has the same random number uh, we expect. In this case, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If it's correct, and if it is a label, then we will allow, then we will get the address at the uh, from the next byte, uh, next four bytes, uh, then we will jump to the target. Okay, so it's kind of like we have a little trampoline there, right? So this is the very first version of 
forward edge CFI, how it is implemented. So CFI, however, it's not a it's a, it's a property. It's not very easy to um achieve. Um, then the second idea we have to defeat ROP is simply just to address space layout randomization, which you are already familiar with. The idea of this is with AS, ASLR, it will be harder to know the address of the gadgets. Uh, however, uh, this approach uh, is also not super effective in practice uh, because there is a lot of information leakage in the applications and also in the kernel to, <coughs> to, to leak the address of um, something. As long as you know the address of something, then you can infer the address of everything, right? Uh, so uh, it can slow down attackers, but um, uh, it's not that effective either. Even uh, you have done several challenges to bypass uh, ASRR. Uh, so the third idea to defeat ROP is uh, how about we simply remove the gadgets, right? Because let's say one of the requirements here is uh, there must be enough gadgets in the address space. Then how about we remove it? Remove, remove all the gadgets. So in this XAC paper back in 2010, uh, the authors uh, proposed uh, uh, this G3 paper, uh, defeating ROP through gadget-less binary. Uh, the idea is actually very simple. So what is a return instruction? In, in ROP, you need a return instruction. And what is return instruction? Like we talked about last class. Return instruction are basically those four different uh, byte values, C3, CB, C2, C8, that's it, right? So if we do not have those values, in our code, then we will not have return instructions. Even if you can still jump to the middle of an instruction, there is no return, then this will not work, right? <clears throat> so the idea is just to remove those from the code. And this is not that difficult. Um, you just change one instruction with those three, four values, to an equivalent instruction. And all of you have done this when you um, develop your own ASCII share code. So the paper simply um, follow the same logic, develop automatic tools to translate uh, the batteries. For example, there could be an instruction jump uh, C8. So this basically uh, means um uh, this one when you this means jump to a relative address from your current address. So after this is compiled, it will actually E9 C3 here, then zero zero zero. Why we have C3 here? Because the instruction itself is five bytes. So you uh, you jump to C8, actually after you compile it will be C3. But then C3 can be interpreted as <coughs> A return instruction. And uh, remove that is easy. Instead of jump C8, we jump C9. Now after that, we have a more loppy instruction. Then we will only have C4 here. We're not going to have C C3. Then we remove, remove the C3, we remove the return instruction. Uh, other instructions can also be uh, changed in similar ways, uh, like what you did uh, when you developed the share code, like uh, uh, and C2 to EAX. You don't want C2, then you can and uh, C1 to EAX, then increase EAX, exactly what you did uh, in the share code. Uh, exclusive or CA to AL. Uh, uh, we also did something like this in our uh, share code. Uh, you can move C9 to BL, then increase BL, then do a inclusive or BL uh, with AA, right? There are basically uh, many ways to do this. Uh, so there could be other more examples, but uh, let's uh, skip that. So the idea of this is just 
to remove gadgets in the address space. So even if the attacker controls the stack, they cannot find enough gadgets in the address space. Of course, <clears throat> this approach is specific to um, defeating ROP. Uh, drop uh, is still jump oriented programming uh, is still possible after you remove ROP gadgets, of course, to to um to make this even safer, you can simply uh, replace or uh, uh, jump, indirect jump gadgets as well. Another approach <coughs> is uh, called the, uh, the monitor control flow integrity approach. Um, actually, um, I'm here at the CCS to present our recent paper. And our paper is also about control flow uh, violation detection, kind of like the control flow monitor. Uh, it's just a, it's a specific to embedded systems and uh, our contribution is we extend previous control flow violation detection to the kernel mode. Yeah, so that's a paper I'm presenting uh, uh, here. I presented it this morning, actually. Uh, so in this 2013 uh, Usenix security uh, paper, um, they, uh, proposed, uh, also there is a lot of paper back in uh, 2012, uh, the authors proposed to uh, monitor the instructions that have been executed and uh, just to calculate in those executed instructions, how many returns are there? So they utilize some hardware tracers <coughs> in modern CPUs. Uh, they usually have some hardware tracers. The, the tracers can record what instructions have been record has been executed to a memory location. Then later, you can analyze that trace record to say how many instructions, how many returns are there. If there are so many returns, then we then, then that's a very simple heuristic. This must be a return-oriented attack because you are not supposed to have so many returns, right? There are probably 5% of returns in the whole trace if it's a benign execution. But uh, as you can say uh, in uh, last class example, the gadgets you have are usually very small. Several instructions, then the return instruction. So the percentage of return instructions in the trace will be much, much higher than a regular benign execution. Okay. So that's a fourth idea. The uh, fifth idea <coughs> uh, is actually uh, one of the features we uh, didn't talk about, but all of you have seen this, right? So, and uh, actually some of you, um, um, Oh uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so this is called a CET feature uh, on the Intel CPUs. Uh, ARM CPU has a similar feature called uh, BIT. Uh, basically, the idea is all indirect branch targets uh, must start with two instructions: the NBR64 or NBR32 instruction. So if your indirect call or you need to work the brand jump or return to a, if it's an indirect one, then it's returned to an instruction that doesn't have this, then the program will crash. The CPU will generate an exception. And this feature is available on many Intel CPUs uh, for Intel CPUs that do not have this feature, uh, those two instructions are basically just not. <clears throat> uh, so you have seen this many times in all our uh, functions, they start with the under BR32. And uh, that's basically the reason why we have that. Okay, so that concludes our discussion on ROP. Uh, do you guys have any questions? <clears throat> Oh, 
Okay, if there are no other questions, we move to our next topic, uh, which is heap and uh, heap exploitation. So many of you remember this um, address space figure. Uh, this is before they are randomized. Um, at the very low end, uh, we have um, the uh, code. Uh, which is also called the text segment. Uh, so after that, we have the data segment. Uh, usually they are uh, initialized uh, global variables. Uh, then we have the BSS section, which are uninitialized variables. And uh, uh, the C standard actually require all of them to be set as zero. So after that, uh, we actually have uh, the subject of today, which is a heap. And uh, you can change the heap, size of the heap, uh, using the brick system call. Uh, higher than that, you will have a <coughs> memory mapped segment, uh, such as the C library. Uh, even higher, you have the stack. So previously, we we're mainly talking about the stack part. And today, we are going to talk about the heap part. As you can see from this picture, some of the segments, memory, regions are not writable, right? The text segment is not supposed to be writable unless it's self-modifying code. Usually it's not writable. The data section, VSS section, they are writable. The heap section is writable. The memory mapped segment, uh, their libraries, they're not supposed to be writable either, their code. Uh, then uh, stack is writable. And the writable areas are the dangerous areas because, uh, Legit programs can write that, and also attackers may be able to write it. <clears throat> so the heap, uh, in this class, we're mainly talking about the application heap, uh, not the kernel heap. The kernel heap's implementation the idea is similar to the um, application heap, but there are two separate heaps. So the heap is a pool of memory used for dynamic allocations at runtime. So heap memory is different from stack memory in that it is persistent between functions. Um, we use malloc <coughs> to grab memories on the heap, or in C++, we use the keyword new. Uh, we also use the free function um, to release memory on the heap. In in C, in C++, uh, delete uh, does similar things. So malloc and free are standard C library fun uh, functions. Uh, so they do not directly map to any system call. So heap management is part of the application. It's part of the C library. Um, it's not directly related to the kernel. Uh, if every malloc you go to the kernel, then you will be very super expensive, uh, computationally expensive. So, uh, however, sometimes if you don't have enough space, it may trigger system call like the a brick system call. But usually, if you just do malloc for small regions, uh, you will not uh, trigger any system call. It's just a function call. So this is a prototype of the function malloc. Um, in malloc, you just ask for some size. Then malloc will return you an address you can use. Um, under the hood, malloc will allocate uh, whatever you ask for uh, of uninitialized storage. Uh, if it's successful, it returns the address for that uh, storage. If it's not su successful, it just returns zero or null. The corresponding um, deconstruction function for malloc is called free. So for free, you need to give a pointer to the free function. Uh, then the free will deallocate the space previously allocated by malloc. Here, there is a tricky thing. Uh, if you give a different address, or if you give it an address which is not previously allocated by malloc, obviously, this obviously there will be a problem. So that will be the attack we will talk about uh, next class. Uh, 
Uh, today we were only talking about <coughs> the the basics of heat. And uh, beside malloc free, uh, there are other helper functions uh, like the calloc function. Uh, the difference in malloc and calloc is uh, malloc doesn't initialize the uh, memory. Uh, however, calloc will initialize the allocated memory to zero. Uh, that's a difference. Uh, the interface also look a little bit different, but uh, basically the same thing. It has a number of items and each item size. For malloc, it's just the size. Also, there is a, a realloc function to resize the memory block pointed by the pointer uh, that was previously allocated with a call to malloc or calloc. Obviously, here, as a programmer, you should correctly give the address of a previously allocated uh, uh, buffer. But if you give it a different buffer, the system will behave uh, in a strange way. And uh, uh, that can be uh, exploited for attack. Uh, next, let's see several concrete examples of how malloc can be used. Uh, we're not talking about how, how malloc uh, is implemented, but just how to use that. Uh, let's say we have a main function, we have a local buffer. We don't have a local buffer, we have a local a pointer, pointer to a buffer. And this one is initialized to null, so it doesn't point to anywhere at the beginning. Okay, so this is a pointer, this is not really a buffer. Uh, then we try to allocate um, 256 bytes, uh, or 100 in hex, and we use malloc. And uh, uh, this piece of code is not the best way, not best practice, because malloc may return zero, like we said. So here we assume malloc doesn't return zero, it will return the buffer, then we move the uh, return value to the local pointer. Then we are going to read <coughs> something from std in to that to that allocated memory. So it's not on the stack. The pointer is on the stack. The pointer points to a memory region. That region is not on the stack. That region is on the heap. And then it print out a hello, uh, that buffer. Then just uh, uh, destroy that buffer using uh, free. Okay, so that's basically how you use malloc and uh, free. So if we compare heap and stack, uh, we can say uh, heap is fixed memory allocation known at compiler time. So in a heap, at the, the prolog of the function, we have seen a subtract ESP some hard coded value, right? We say uh, instruction stack. And that hard coded value basically, and that subtract instruction basically is to allocate a fixed size uh, memory. And uh, it's fixed at the compiler time, not runtime. And a stack can also be used to store local variables. We have, been, we have seen a lot of that, like a buffer, like the pointer here. The pointer here is only four bytes. Uh, it has nothing to do with the size of the buffer itself. Uh, then return addresses, function arguments, those are stored on the stack. The benefit of <coughs> stack is uh, it's it's very fast. And uh, the allocation is done by the compiler. How fast it is? I mean, allocate a local variable is just a subtract some address, some number from ESP. Then you reference those address from EBP. That's it, right? Just the several instructions. It actually abstracts away the concept of allocating and deallocating, right? However, heap is different. A uh, heap is dynamic memory allocation at runtime. Uh, and if we're talking about application heap, then that part totally happens in the application, not parallel. Then usually you use this for uh, bigger objects. You use it for things that should be persistent across functions. 
However, it's much slower. It's done by programmer. The programmer <coughs> used malloc to do that. But malloc is a function, right? Here, we only say malloc is a function. But this function is a complicated function. There are so many instructions inside this malloc function. Compared to stack, only one or two instructions. This is much, much slower. <clears throat> At a C level, you do malloc three. At a C plus plus level, you can do you can use new and delete uh, for uh, objects. So there are many different popular uh, versions of uh, heap implementations. Uh, here, here obviously we're talking about the application heap. Uh, one is doc d malloc or dl malloc. Uh, so this is still the native version of malloc in uh, some Linux. Then there is uh, pt malloc, which is based on dl malloc and was extended for use with multiple threads. Um, I think most of the Linux systems right now, uh, the C library you use, <coughs> use pt malloc. Uh, there is also TC malloc, it's Google's implementation of malloc, uh, and uh, uh, JE malloc uh, implemented by somewhere else. And also there is a, a heap management system called uh, Hort. Uh, they didn't call it malloc anymore, Hort. Uh, this is developed by the UMass professor, uh, Emery Berger. He implemented this and also uh, he still maintains this. So if you want to check what kind of malloc uh, you are using on your own laptop or what malloc we are using on our server, uh, you just need to do a uh, DLL version. Uh, you use the DLL to, in the wrapper tag to find out the address of the C libraries. Uh, you can use DLL version to say, uh, what is the default uh, C library version uh, we are using here? So, for example, on my laptop, uh, I, I don't remember when I took this screenshot, but whatever. Um, I was using a GDPC uh, 2.31, this version. And then you can find the source code of the malloc online. And uh, the malloc I'm using is actually PT malloc version 2. Z. So uh, let's first give an overview of the DL malloc as that is um, the basis of all other malloc versions. Um, so um, the goal of DL malloc is to uh, maximize portability. So it doesn't really rely on much system dependent features. Try to uh, do not use system calls, uh, use them as few as possible, right? Uh, and to try to make it portable to uh, Mac, Windows, or any other operating systems. Uh, it tries to minimize the space it uses. Uh, the allocator should not waste memory. Uh, it should obtain the least amount of memory from the system it requires and maintain memory in ways that minimize fragmentation. So you should avoid creating a large number of continuous chunks of memory that are not used by the program. Um, also, uh, the performance. You should, uh, the functions should uh, return as fast as possible. Uh, there are uh, some other um, design goals uh, like locality, which means allocate chunks of memory that are typically requested or used together near each other. So this will help minimize CPU pages and the cache misses, uh, minimize, uh, maximize error detection and uh, minimize uh, aluminics. So those were the design goals of um, DLMalloc, but it doesn't mean DLMalloc is secure. It doesn't mean it is perfect. So here we are looking at the implementation of that 2.31 um, um, PT malloc 2. So one of the most important structure here is this malloc chunk structure. 
this is the basic unit of uh, uh, memory that um, that malloc allocates. And this structure has this kind of format. Uh, first, at the very beginning, it has a M chunk previous size field. So this field is always used. Then there is a M chunk size field. So both of those fields are always used. In a 32-bit machine, those fields are just four bytes. In a 64-bit machine, both of them are eight bytes. Now, after that, there are two more fields. One is both of them are pointers and they point to the previous or the next malloc chunk. So which makes this a double link. So actually in many implementations, they're not necessarily double link, but both pointers exist. Traditionally, there should be a double link, but uh, latest implementations is not necessarily a double link. We will say it later. However, those two fields are only used when this malloc chunk is not storing any data. If this is used to store data, then this part doesn't exist. This is where your data is. Um, so to visualize this, uh, we can use this heap chunk figure. So whenever you call malloc and it returns successfully to you, it actually returns you this address here, the buffer. That's what malloc returns to you to the programmers. And the programmers will be able to use the buffer like this. However, when we're using 32-bit machine as example here. However, in front of this data, the buffer you get, there are actually some metadata. Those are what we talked before. The M chunk previous size and M chunk size, those two. On 32-bit machines, there are four bytes each, and they are metadata. The pointer you get is here. It'd be four bytes higher or uh, lower, you get chunk size. Four bytes higher and uh, lower, you get a previous chunk size. So <coughs> the previous chunk size uh, basically specifies the size of the previous chunk if that previous chunk is free. And the chunk size specifies the size of entire chunk, including the metadata and the data part. So the data part may be what you ask for, may be bigger than what you ask for. We will see example later, because the, uh, the allocator just want to do some alignment to make the system faster. So it may be bigger than what you ask for. However, the size of chunks include the size of data and also the metadata here. Okay. So the chunk size part actually also have some flags. Uh, because of the alignment, we do not really use all the 32 <coughs> bits to represent the chunk size. Uh, the lower three bits uh, would always be um, the lower three bits are used as flags. So there are, since there are uh, three bits, yeah, then we can have uh, um, the least significant bit used to indicate whether the previous chunk is free or not. Uh, the second bit is to indicate if the current chunk is obtained by memory map. So memory map has a, a little bit similar mechanism as malloc. Uh, we were we will skip the memory map part, but today we will only focus on uh, malloc. Uh, then the third bit um, also set if the chunk belongs to a thread arena. Uh, we are not going to talk about that level of uh, details. Uh, okay, so <coughs> let's say 
we have four fa ma malloc function calls here. malloc32, malloc4, malloc20, and malloc0. Then how many bytes on the heap is the allocator going to um, allocate for us, All right? So we can test that using uh, this simple program. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to call malloc times. Each time we're going to specify the size we want. That's what the developer wants. The developer wants 32 bytes, 4 bytes, 20 bytes, 0 bytes. That's legal. It's legal to ask a malloc for 0 bytes. 64 bytes, 32, 32, 32. Right. Uh, then we get the pointers. The malloc, if the malloc is successful, we will get we ask for 10 memory chunks, malloc chunks. So we are going to get 10 malloc chunks. That's this part. Now after that, we are going to print out the address of the, <clears throat> we are going to print out the address of each buffer. Uh, basically what the malloc returns to us. And we are going to uh, subtract one from another so we can get the distance of them. So if we run this program, so this is a program heap sizes on our server. Uh, I'm on VPN and uh, my internet is not very stable. Let's see if we can get it to uh, work here. Uh, if it doesn't work, if my internet is too slow, then Oh, it's not that bad. <clears throat> so heap sizes, let's say 32 bit. <clears throat> so if you will run this, you can see. Malloc. 32 returns this address and is actually 48 bytes to the next pointer. Then the next one, we have a malloc four. We only ask for four bytes. However, 16 bytes to the next pointer. We already said that there are eight bytes of metadata, right? So we ask for 34, 32 bytes then malloc will use eight bytes of metadata that makes it 40 bytes. However, malloc actually give us eight more bytes there to make it alignment, right? So malloc actually give us more than we asked for. We asked for 32 bytes, uh, malloc actually gave us 40 bytes. Uh, uh, 40 minor, 48 minus eight, that eight is metadata. So we'll ask for four bytes, give us 16 bytes, we ask for four, 20 bytes, give us 32 bytes. Actually, 32 minus eight will be 24 bytes. Even if you do malloc zero, it will allocate some address. Some. Uh, which means you actually have eight bytes to use, right? So that is basically um, the outputs of um, about. So let me remind you that the heap usually goes from low address to higher address. And uh, as you can see here, the, the first malloc give us a lower address. The second malloc give us a higher address. B0, E0, F0, right? So then from 500 to 600. So the heap goes from no address to high address. This is different from um, stack. Stack goes from high address to no address. <clears throat> so if we want to 
So uh, that's basically what we talk about, the pen chunks and uh, the size of each. So if you uh, uh, compare the results uh, we have just done, you will understand that um, there are 10 chunks. Uh, chunk one will have four bytes of previous chunk size, current chunk size, then the memory buffer itself. Then the distance from here to the next buffer is 48 bytes. And eight of them are used for <coughs> the second buffer's metadata, like chunk two's chunk size and chunk two's previous chunk size, one size. Right. So the 64 bit version uh, is actually. Uh, similar. It's just the address will be even bigger. Uh, the alignment is uh, uh, similar. So as you can see that, um, even if we're asking for 32 bytes in malloc, uh, we actually get more than that. Um, first of all, there are metadata, and also for alignment reasons, uh, we get more. Even with the malloc zero, we get something. So in this figure, uh, we show um, how the malloc and um, let's say this part is a little bit difficult to explain. Uh, let's do it this way. So in this figure, um, the top is a lower address, the bottom is a higher address, and we have three chunks here, uh, chunk A, chunk B, and chunk C. Uh, chunk A has its own metadata, a uh, previous size, size, and the user data. And chunk A has been free. So right now, programmer is not supposed to use chunk A. Programmer has already freed the address A. However, the chunk still exists. The metadata still, still uh, exists. Oh, sorry. Uh, chunk A is being free. We're trying to free chunk A. Uh, however, chunk B at this moment is already free, which means the previous size, then, um, then the, the chunk B right now looks like this. It has previous size, it has its current size, and in current size, there is a bit called previous in use, right? So we, we talked about that uh, here. That's one of the facts here. And this bit tells us if the previous chunk, which is previous B's, chunk B's previous chunk is chunk A, whether that chunk is in use. Since we are freeing A, A has not been freed yet. That's why this bit is one, which means chunk A is being used. The chunk B, because it's a freed chunk, it doesn't have data, right? <clears throat> Instead, so it doesn't really have the data part. It doesn't have the user data. Because we don't have user data, we have other metadata here. And that metadata is this forward chunk pointer and backward chunk pointer, okay? So if there is data, we don't have this. If there is no data, we will have the metadata of forward pointer and the backward pointer. And you can see here, the forward pointer, there is a forward pointer, the backward pointer. Then chunk C is in use. Then chunk C has previous size. Then chunk C also has previous in use because chunk C's previous chunk is chunk B and chunk B is free. So the previous in size is this bit is set of zero. And chunk C is in in use, so chunk C has data. All right, so uh, that basically another uh, example. Okay, so here is another example code. <coughs> we are trying to print out the metadata. Uh, in the previous example, we didn't print out the metadata. We just calculated the size of them. So the next example, we are going to print out uh, the metadata of them uh, as well. So first, 
we have a print chunks function. This print chunks function takes two arguments. Uh, the first argument is basically the address of the buffer, whatever malloc returns to you. Now after that, we have an unsigned int, uh, just to um, just to bring out uh, how much that asks. So the in this print function, we have we print uh, how many things we print. Um, so this part is the format string, as you can see. Then we print out pointer minus two dereference that, which is the previous size, right? Which is this part. Then we print out the pointer minus one de uh, dereference, then will be the chunk size. <coughs> So after that, we print out the pointer itself. Then that's then we ask for many memories with different size from zero to sixteen thousand. So if we run this one, sorry, uh, <laughs> so nice to uh, keep chunks uh, sorry two bit. Hi guys, can you hear me? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I lost the internet like several seconds there. Yeah, okay, I think cool. the um, internet is like really choppy. We'll just go with the slides. Just. Yeah. So you can see if we run the thirty-two bit version, you can say um. Because all of the all of the previous um malloc chunks are in use in this case they were not free so the previous chunks part is not really so it's set as zero so this part is only used uh, when so you can see here this part is only used when the size of when the priv the privilege is free. Okay, but right now they're not free. So this part was just zero. Then the size, um, it's not only the size, it size has also the flags here. Then it has so we are going to um 
of freedom. So we have a code to freedom here. <clears throat> so now you should understand that there are basically two states for the heap chunks. Uh, one state is this particular chunk is in use. Uh, another ca case is this particular chunk is free. If this part is in use, there is a data part which users can use. If it's free, then no one cares about the data, right? Then there will be four bytes of forward and four bytes of backward. In this example, because everything is in use, so there is no forward or backward. So in this piece of code, uh, we first malloc 10, we must, uh, five. We first malloc five chunks here. We malloc five chunks. So there are they are data. Because they are in use, we only print out previous size, current size. That's it. Then we are going to free all of them one by one. So after we free them. There are more information in current size, forward, forward pointer, and backward pointer. So we use two different functions to print that. The in use one we only print out uh those two metadata. <clears throat> However, for, for the free one, we print out those two metadata. We we'll also print out the forward, which is at the location of buffer, and the back, which is the location of plus the plus the side buffer. Uh, so if we, hmm? I should have a. Huh. It's really uh, just the the free heaps part on uh, to the next class. So the uh, so next class we will be how works. For uh, is um parts already uploaded the homework. Uh, and also the slides. Uh, I will upload the video later. Um, the actual uh, is you are going to connect by in the ROP 32 bit program, ROP 2 bit program. And to help you to do this, uh, I want you to explain the source code in the slides uh, line by line. Uh, just to Google the instructions if you don't understand what's going on. Uh, then you explain what to say in the program, uh, and you need to develop your own uh, and show me your work. And the hint I give is, um, is actually the beginning of the site. Uh, the, the beginning of the will look like this. To make sense easier, I just use 32 bit. <clears throat> you need to look for the this gadget. Uh, then you need to um, somehow find the address you can use. You can put things uh, there as your uh, reconstructed step. Then after that, uh, you are going to run uh, heap sizes and run heap chunks. Uh, very simple. And the experience. And uh, there will be uh, 15 bonus points this class 
uh, you basically need to capture the flag of format string eight, uh, 32 bit by overwriting the variables. Um, so it's very similar to the previous, maybe format string six or seven. Uh, you're also overwriting three variables. It's just the values of those, those three variables uh, are different from the previous ones. Okay, so that's basically the homework for this week and the video for this week. Uh, next week, we're going to uh, meet in person. Uh, sorry about the inconvenience uh, recently. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Okay, if there's no, no questions, then uh, see you guys next week. All right, see you.